Welcome here to the courtyard of the Alpha School of Music. It is with great pride that I welcome you to the Alpha Institute and to the home of the Alpha School of Music. Alpha has come a long way in the last few years and is today Jamaica's only tertiary school focused on our ensemble music education. The Sisters of Mercy in Jamaica, sponsors of this institution, have made it their priority to support youth music education and banded music in particular. This commitment dates back to the very first Sisters of Mercy who arrived in Jamaica in 1890, one of whom, Sister Maria de Chantal Higgins, founded a music program based on the drum and fife core, an early band format. Since then, Sister Ignatius may be the most recognizable Sister of Mercy thanks to her work with the Alpha Boys Band. In recognition of Sister Ignatius' accomplishments and in her memory, the Alpha School of Music has launched the Sister Ignatius Lecture. The lecture will be an annual event intended to highlight the impact of band music in Jamaica, at Alpha in particular, and bring attention to best practices in music education as it relates to our society, economy, culture, and identity. Thank you to the Alpha students and staff for making this event possible. A special welcome to our guests, each and every one of you, all of you attending here, some perhaps for the first time. Many thanks to our sponsors, American Friends of Jamaica, Jamaica Tourist Board, Ministry of Culture, Spanish Court Hotel, Jamaica Nice, and of course, the Sisters of Mercy. Welcome. Thank you, Miss Margaret Little Wilson. That is, a, that was our administrator of the Alpha Institute. Now, um, whenever I start a program, I have to give a little explanation. Most of you are familiar with Alpha. Alpha has been around, as Miss Little Wilson said, for 143 years. And in 20, goodness, 21, the Sisters of Mercy decided to take a next step in its um, education of young boys. Up until that point, it had been, and still is, vocational training. And one of the skills, vocational skills, that the sisters gave the boys was music. And over the years, countless musicians of caliber and countless influential musicians have come from these very grounds here. And in 2021, the Sisters of Mercy decided to take another step to open a second school, the Alpha School of Music, which is for students in the vocational program who wish to further their studies after doing the two years in the vocational program. If they want to do further studies and get an associate degree, they can enter into the Alpha School of Music. And the Alpha School of Music is open not just to graduates of the vocational program, but also to any girl or boy, male or female. As of last year, we're, we're now accepting females. So any female or male, 16 to 25 years, who desire to study music, and in particular, band music. Right. So when we speak of Alpha now, we're speaking of two schools. School that has been here for 143 years and the new Alpha School of Music. So, my name is Gay Magnus and I am the bandmaster for the Alpha School of Music. And I will be <laughs> moderating what has, is going to be, I'm sure, a very exciting discussion. Um, 
it's well, Mr. Fabulson explained to you why um, the lecture series is called the Sister Ignatius Lecture Series because she was so influential in um, the development of musicians here. And uh, we hope that this is a first of many important, meaningful discussions in, on, in music. Now, to start off our lecture series, this is a inaugural one, we are very pleased to have not just our local musicians and local experts in band culture, but also our friends from the Caribbean who are also good musicians and knowledgeable in band culture from their different regions. And I'm going to um, give an introduction of, to them of them very soon. But it's important that our discussions include the broader Caribbean because our music culture has been shaped by the same socio-historical factors, same European influence, same African influence. We've been influenced by the USA um, in all our music. And also, we influence each other. If you look into the history of Jamaican music, and I dare say of any Caribbean music, you won't have to dig too far before you find a musician from another island that has been playing, playing a significant role, right? And I'm, I'm sure the same can be said for music of the different islands. We influence each other, okay? So we may be islands, but certainly in terms of our music, there is a lot of cross-fertilization. So it's very important that our discussion um, in, involves the region. All right, so let me introduce um, our panelists. And I'm just going to start by the the gentleman closest to me, Mr. Omar Francis. He's a guitarist, an educator, and band leader at the forefront of live music in Kingston. And for those of you who are familiar with the jam at 22 Jerk, he's one of the founders, am I correct? One of them. One of the founders, yes, and the musicians. Every Thursday you can see him there, there um, playing and, and supporting local musicians. And tomorrow, let me add, Tomorrow, all of these musicians here, maybe we can convince Peter, but certainly <laughs> the first three will be performing at the jam. We'll be jamming at the jam. Okay, it's a jam, it's not a concert, it's, it's a jam. And so we look forward to that and we invite you to come tomorrow at 7 p.m. at 22 Jerk, 22 Barbican Road. Right, for those of you who, are, who haven't been there yet, it's gonna be, um, quite an experience. So, Mr. Omar Francis, and he is a member of Roots Underground, um, a guitarist in Roots Underground too. Yes, which we need to hear more of. <laughs> Next up, we have Dr. Nicholas Branca from Barbados. Right. Dr. Branca is a Grammy-nominated producer and musician and he has been a staunch advocate for youth music education, ensemble performance, and is a civil society conversation, and a civil society conversation through music. So welcome, Dr. Branco. And beside Dr. Branco, we have Mr. Etienne Charles from Trinidad. Etienne Charles is a trumpet trumpeter and a big band leader, hailed by the New York Times and by Jazz Times as a daring improviser who delivers with heart-wrenching lyricism. Wow. <laughs> yes, we're very pleased to have Mr. Etienne Charles. He is a, an excellent musician. They all are excellent musicians, but also um, quite, quite a historian and very passionate about um, music history and music culture. And we're very glad to have him here and looking forward to his comments. And at the end, we have Mr. Peter Ashburn of Jamaica. <laughs> Peter Ashburn is one of Jamaica's leading contemporary composers, arrangers, and songwriters, as well as an outstanding performer on the violin and the piano. He's one of those people, you know, who are good at classical and jazz one of them, so. <laughs> so welcome, Peter. 
and has years and years of experience as a band leader in Jamaica. All right, so banding together, ensemble music in the Caribbean. And can I thank Dr. Josh for that title? I just think it's so cool, banding together. There is Dr. Josh, thank you for that. Ensemble music in the Caribbean. So um, I have to tell you, we've, been, we've met today at different occasions, and I, I'm actually wondering, is there anything left to discuss? Because we spoke through lunch, when we were in the green room a while ago, we were speaking, you know, I'm like, wait, hold on, save some of this conversation <laughs> for the audience. Mm. Right. So, all right, well, let's, let's start. I, I would like to, um, let me sit down first. So we're going to start, first of all, I would like to go down the line and everybody to just give their opinion um, about what, where they think, that, what they think the status of band music is in their respective fields. Is it thriving? Do people still want to listen to band music? Um, is there an outlet for band music? And one question I'm particularly interested in, what age people what, what is it, you know, age people are actually listening to band music and is that an issue? And by band music, we have several kinds of bands in the Caribbean. We have the reggae calypso, we have jazz bands, we have steel bands, we have concert bands. So bands in general. Yes, soca bands, of course, we can't forget the soca bands. So, Omar. Well, thanks for asking. Thanks to everybody for being here. Um, to be amazing. Uh, I'll say that if you'd asked me this maybe three or four years ago, I might have been a little pessimistic. But over the past little while, I've seen a real um, renaissance, I think, beginning. Uh, not just at the jam where we get all these younger, much younger than me people coming and doing interesting things that I wouldn't have thought of that I don't know how they do sometimes. But also, I've just started teaching, and I'm finding that wonderful just because I find these kids to be fantastic. Like, they think in a way that's so sophisticated for their age, and they're thinking, oops, they're thinking um, in a joined up way, they're thinking in a macro way, they're thinking in ways that maybe I wasn't trained to think in, so I'm very appreciative of the possibilities that I'm seeing. And I just now want to encourage spaces where that can be developed further, and I like hope that we're all on the same page with this, that we, that we want to see this succeed. And for that to work, we need there to be places to play, there need to be places to listen, there need to be places to interact with, on all levels, vertically, horizontally. Thank you. You spoke about um individuals but is that translated into bands as well yeah well that's what i mean like they're thinking they're thinking about the music uh in a group way in a collective way. and they're tying what they're doing and what they're doing individually into larger conversations larger narratives both historically but also with the people that they're working with um, both here and at the other places where i teach there's there's like a real like it seems possibility in the air so it's, again it's just to foster it I hope that it continues to um, grow. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Nicholas. There is a lot of potential for improvement in the way that we approach bands, um, specifically in Barbados, and I think it is the case in Trinidad as well. Bands function only as accompaniment for singers. Um, while that is a crucial role to play, I do not think it is the only role that a band should play. I look forward to a time when we can have more visible and accessible 
expositions of instrumental music that is reflective of our region um, and also musically challenging enough that it inspires interest and desire from people in other parts of the world to play what we play. Um, I say that because instrumental music does not seem to have as crucial a place in our societies as it does in other societies. I can hear instrumental music from America, jazz, classical, whatever it is. I can hear it from Europe. I can hear it from the Far East. I can hear it from South America a lot. But I don't really hear a lot of it from the Caribbean. And my belief is that music can really only thrive if it can express itself without lyrics. It is important, while I am very supportive of the idea of a song and a person singing it and having it and accompaniment, I am also committed entirely to the concept of melody, separate and distinct from lyric. And I think that it is important that we challenge ourselves. And one of the ways that we should challenge ourselves is to find ways to express ourselves musically without lyrics and um, as I think through history a lot of the music that lasts that is representative of different cultures and different societies is that there is choral music and there is singing music but there is instrumental music that reflects the nature of a person or a people without the word. The word becomes the focus when it is in the song. And I think that there are ways to express ourselves that are non-verbal that we should explore more. And the more musicians that know how to play, I think the more we will get a chance to access that. That's just my opening salvo in this. I hope that I get to say other things as time passes. My name is Etienne Charles, so glad to be here, and even more excited to be talking about band music, because one of the first bands I ever played in was led by a gentleman sitting there who lives between Jamaica and Trinidad, the great Tony Woodruff, I'd like to give him a round of applause. He was my second trumpet teacher and took me on my first tour to Venezuela when I was 12 years old, and was a great mentor. And talking about band music, I'm sorry, this is literally, you know, what I love, uh, and specifically Caribbean band music and the history of it. And to be on such a distinguished panel, you know, with different generations of, of, of music enthusiasts. And with respect to the state of band music now, before we talk about band music now, I want, I want you all to take a second and look back. Now, um, in Trinidad, where, where I'm from, um, Music wasn't recorded with vocalists until long after music was recorded with instrumentalists. So we, we actually had a, a band culture, instrumental music culture for a long time. And, and the history is coming out now where there was a band called Lovey String Band, which was led by a man named George Bailey. And they recorded in New York um, in 1912, they did two albums in June of 1912. Um, uh, integrated band musicians, Black, Creole, and Euro Descendant. And they performed all over the US, toured. And it's a band where they improvised, they played Caribbean folk songs, they played original compositions of musicians in the band. And that somehow was not called jazz, okay? Now fast forward five years to 1917, and you have the fullest jazz band being documented as recording on phonograph, the original Dixieland jazz band, which was recorded in January of 1917. I wish we had a speaker who could play some of Lovey's band. So 
So we, we've had that in the Caribbean. You had people like Lionel Belasco, who was a, a phenomenal composer and pianist. He had a quartet, and then he had almost like a sextet. It was the, the, back then they called them combos. This is in the 19 teens and 1920s. Um, at this time, Venezuela was, was almost like a European nation in terms of its power, and it was starting to flex with oil. And so many people were moving to Venezuela to get work. And a lot of times you see musicians move to where the work is. And so Belasco moved to Venezuela. Then he moved back to Trinidad shortly before moving to New York. And he became a Tin Pan Ali ghost writer. So there's music that he may have written that we don't even know about. And then you fast forward, World War II was, I think, the most important event of the 20th century because it's the it's the event that brought radio waves to the english-speaking caribbean when the u.s troops built two bases in trinidad they brought radio stations with them and they piped their music so as a result the first music that was mass consumed in trinidad was glenn miller tommy dorsey and as a result of that big band music became popular and it became popular all over the Caribbean and then you had people like Paris Prado all these groups were coming through Trinidad on their way to go tour in Brazil and Venezuela so that's when the band music evolved to start having you know the, the heavy brass feel you have people like Rupert Nurse who started doing all these great arrangements for Kitchen etc Fitzborn Brian also had a great group and then you fast forward you end up with Joey Lewis, who was an incredible arranger, um, an incredible band leader. And he took some, in, some great solos on some Mighty Spiral albums. There was always an improvisation element in the Calypsos, specifically in the recordings you hear. Fitzroy Coleman and all of them, Frankie Francis, Errol Lentz, who got along as Postman, um, of course, Joey Lewis. But the band culture started to pick up because the bands would work recording backing up the vocalist like Nichols was talking about. So if you look, look at any old Calypso record, it would say something like the Mighty Spiral, and then it would say the name of the orchestra, whether it was the Joey Lewis Orchestra or, you know, Sal Duncan's Orchestra. But those bands by themselves, without singers, would play dances all over the Caribbean. You know, and um, there was another band called the Dutch Boys, which was led and then Pete de Vluc, whose family was from Suriname. And so there was this dance culture and band culture. And I think, um, and it, it, part of it was because of education. You had St. Dominic's, like, kind of like Alpha. There's, there was a home where there was a lot of music education happening. People like Roy Cape, they all came out of this home and they would walk over to the US Embassy and they would read downbeat magazines, you know, to learn about people like Paul Desmond and all of the great horn players that were on all of these great recordings. Believe it or not, the, the, the owner of Rhino's record shop, I discovered, was a trumpet player. He played trumpet on some early recordings in the 1920s in Trinidad. So band culture, I think it needs to come back to where it was. Uh, and I agree with Nicholas that the focus on, the focus on vocal music, it, it's not that it's, a negative thing, but we need to find a space for people to want to consume and appreciate more music from an instrumental standpoint. Because melodies don't have a language; they don't they don't have a spoken language. So immediately, it removes the barriers of people who don't speak the language listening and understanding. So that's where I will pause for my first contribution. Thank you. I can't speak to, I can't name names and, and, and things, but I, the curve of bands in Jamaica, I know um, I don't want to go back to, I just simply don't know enough, but there was a time in the, what, 40s, 1940s, 1950s, and 60s, where there were a number of bands with some politicians in them, by the way. Now, you know, and uh, it was a thriving business. It, 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 that was part of the culture, you know, to when people went to be entertained and to dance, 
they went to something that had a live band. And um, when the recording, recording industry started up, you know, the sound systems were getting into gear. Well, they were already in gear, but they were another, an alternative stream. And then I think, by the time we got to the 1960s, it was the bigger bands that had survived, eh? The, the um, Byron Marley. Lees and the you know, Carlos Malcolm and, uh, what is it? Yeah, Fab Five it had got started. <coughs> you know, Fab Five started, what, 60, 68, I think. Um, and that started going and then that whole scat and its and its um, evolution started coming to the fore, and all of a sudden, the dance bands started to go out of favor. I don't know if it was. I know economics was part of it because um, because a sound system costs a fraction of what a band costs, you know. But the bands started to fade away, and pretty soon we were left with either show bands, um, as um, was mentioned earlier on, bands that accompanied singers, and a few of those dance bands, the, the all-purpose bands, which was Fab, Fab Five, Byron Lee, what is it, Bear Essentials, and um, there were a couple of others. And then by the time we got in the 1970s, it was, you know, it was what, what, what the, the, the dance bands were just Fab Five and Byron Lee, no? Or the 1980s. So w what has happened is that nowadays, I think Fab Five is probably the only dance band that is consistently working as a, as a group. All the other bands are show bands, they're accompanying singers. Jamaicans, I get the feeling that when you play instrumental music, it is either they don't hear it, or it's an excuse to talk. And that, um, that's a sad state of affairs, you know? In other words, <coughs> but um, you were saying that it's, it's um, we need to find a space for instrumental music. I, I have a little anecdote. I got into a little argument with this lovely lady once, you know, the argument you shouldn't get into, which is, which is better, poetry or music. And I, you know, I, I took it down, took it down good-naturedly, and we, we had a little banter, this, that, and the other. Then she paused, and she said, well, you know, music is very nice, but when I think of a really well-written poem, I'm not sure anything can come close to it. And that's when I realized she was talking about vocal music, because to her, music is vocal music. As I said, the instrumental music doesn't exist. Whereas I'm talking about the instrumental music that doesn't need words. That's the argument, the, 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 the valid argument about which is better, poetry or music, instrumental music or other thing. But this is a discussion about bands, eh? Yes, thank you, thank yeah. you. Um, absolutely. So what happened? like a glory days and um, they're no longer here and there's a desire for bands to come back. But my question now is, you, you, uh, Peter mentioned some very valid reasons as to why uh, band culture is not as popular anymore, economics. We have the technology, you know, um, we don't have to have musicians, live musicians, to create music anymore. We have, you know, band in a box, the, the digital audio workstations. So my question is, how relevant is band music, live music, 
instrumental music in this day and age? Why should a youngster spend, how many years have you played your guitar? 35. 35. How many years have you played your bass, Nicholas? More than that. More than that. <laughs> how many years have you been playing trumpet? No yeah. comment. No comment. <laughs> Peter, no comment. <laughs> But the, the point is to, to really master instrument. I mean, it's it's a lifelong, lifelong um, adventure. So, what is the benefit? Why should a, a, a young musician today, you know, say, "Oh, I'm going to spend the rest of my life trying to master this musician and play in a band when it's cheaper and I don't need as much, you know, skill to create music." Digital. Well, I would like to say that, first off, let me say that there are some phenomenal young musicians in the Caribbean. Um, in Jamaica, I've met some, I know of some. In Barbados, the same. In Trinidad, the same. There was a time I was a young musician. Um, that time is slowly beginning to pass. Um, but I, I think that where we need to work as a region is on getting those young people who are, most of them are working a lot and they're playing a lot, um, but getting them to see the value in expressing themselves in music with their own voice. Um, because what a, what a lot of them do not know that they have is a voice that is unique to them. And so they kind of get caught up in playing in environments where they all do the same thing or do similar things because they figure that that is how people will consume what they do. Um, but the individuality of an instrument, an, in, an instrumentalist, is what makes it attractive to the audience. We have to control the audience. We cannot let the audience control us. So, um, if we find a way, because this is not really about solutions, this is about trying to find what the problems are and trying to address them. If we find and can consistently think about ways that the young musicians get a chance to express their voices through their instruments more. I think that we will begin to have more variety in our music. Um, because it if it is that we focus on the person that is in front of the band, if we focus on the singer who is more, more often than not in front of the band, then the people who are playing behind that person become interchangeable. You could just say, well, okay, I need a different bass player because this body can't come tonight. But once the song is performed, we are all right. But Even though times have changed, and I acknowledge all of these technological changes, I know that if I am playing, the bar sounds different from if somebody else is playing. And that is largely because I have been encouraged to develop my voice, right? So that I am confident that what I say is of value, regardless of what else is happening on the stage. And I think we need to work more on 
giving that latitude. I'm not saying you have to hog the show, but that's a whole nother issue. But what I'm saying is finding a way to encourage individuality of expression in a way that makes you indispensable to the music that is being played at the time. Am I making sense? Yeah. Okay, thank you. I wasn't sure for a minute. Thank you. There's an economic reality though. How if you want somebody to spend that much time, you know, um, how they're gonna live? How will they live? That's, um, and especially in a place like Jamaica. One of the, one of the things that happens in Jamaica is um, you don't see not even the performing bands, the, the show bands. You don't even see them very often. Why? Because um, it's a small circle. The Jamaica circle is a small circle. If you play, what, what can you do? Play two concerts in Kingston, and one concert in Mandeville, and try, you know, get something in Montego Bay, something in Portland, and that's it, right? If you're going to make invest in a band, you go on tour in the U.S., right? And it's, it's a, it's a six-week tour, and you play two places a week, you know, so um, the small circle in Jamaica doesn't make it worthwhile for all of that. So there's an economic reality, and uh, you have to, you have to find a way to overcome that, I think, you know, but... So, so is it that, yes, the economic reality is real. That's a, that's a real issue. Um, is it that musicians now have to, um, you know, the people are saying you need multiple streams of income. Is it that you can't survive only as a, as a musician in a band? But the truth is that, I, I mean, there are enough musicians in here that can tell you that that has always been the case. I mean, musicians have always had to do whatever it is they had to do in order to get to play. People worked their jobs, people worked night shifts, people did whatever they had to do in order to realize the dream. What I think we have a problem with now is making the dream seem possible. So the sacrifice is less likely, I suppose, to be made. We want to feel like if we put the effort in, or with minimal effort, we get maximum benefit. Um, Could have. And I don't know that that is, I don't know that's a recipe for success. Um, but I know musicians who played in bands and then left and did security guard work and then went and packed groceries in the day and then went and played again at night and did that for years, you know what I mean? Because it's what they believed in. And I know that there is an economic concern, but I also know that if there is a desire and there is a will, ways will be found. That is, that is my belief. Okay. Um, I, I, on that point, I saw a glimpse of Steve Woodham here, and it's very nice of him to come. And Steve Woodham gives me a thought about how the classical musicians deal with it. Now, there are people who have uh, started music, you know, in, while they were students in school, high school students. And when they, you know, the high school students, usually when you take exams, that's when you stop um, playing your instrument. But some people continue. And what happens is that those people still continue to play instruments. And they, they are the ones who are in what, the community bands. And those are the ones who um, play in the classical groups. They have a job, and you know what they call a day job, and they also play music. Maybe that is the reality here. I don't know. Well, 
I can say from personal experience, when I was 18, I graduated from high school, and before I went to university, I was working in a backing band at the time. I have never made so much money in my life again as I made in that one year, in 19, this is 1993 to 1994. So for me, it's like incontrovertible and obvious that there's fewer gigs than there were. Like, it's definitely the case. There's fewer gigs in Jamaica anyway than there were when I was, when I was 18 years old. Uh, I would say that it's probably harder now than it was then because of that fact. But in direct response to your question about like what, what you'd say to a, a young musician about why band culture, why the band. Um, it's I mean, I think Nicholas made a very good point about disposability. Uh, so much of the world today is um, disposable. Everything is disposable. People are reacting to it, you know? So everybody I interact with, every, all the students, everybody really, I make this point, you are not disposable. And especially as a musician, you're definitely not disposable. And why don't we start leaning into that, leaning into that aspect? And we have a tradition here of people from extremely disparate cultures, even within Africa, and then from all over the world as well, finding a way to make things work together, and finding a means of communication when one isn't necessarily obvious. And if we start leaning into that part of our history, that part of our uh, tradition, I think we'll find creative ways of expressing the individuality which, which we all know is real here in the Caribbean and here in the New World in particular, and expressing it collectively because it would be dumb for us to try and compete uh, in mass culture in terms, of, uh, in terms of numbers. What we need to do is quality and not quantity. And if we focus on that quality, focus on like the coffee or like whatever, like high-end stuff, and that's where the band stuff comes in. The highest quality music you're gonna hear is great musicians working together to create great music. So if we start aiming towards greatness and not settle for goodness, that's, that's something to work towards, that's something to live for on a certain level. You know? And then those sacrifices that you're talking about maybe are easier to make. Maybe it's easier to say, boy, I'm working towards something. There's something for me to live for here, as opposed to just, you know, whatever, us then. Yeah. Yes, yes, indeed. And perhaps too, we, I mean, we could um, make more of the digital era and the digital tools that we have. Um, traditionally, band music, it's, it's live. You have, you have a band stand, the band performs, and the audience is there. But perhaps we could do more um, online performances as well. So everything that you all said about the individuality expressing yourself on that instrument, which up to now you can't really do as much on a computer. So you're playing your live instruments, but to an um, online audience. And during COVID, the online performances, you know, a few of them happen, but I'm hoping that with improved technology, online performances, um, the quality of them from the audience perspective will improve and maybe that's an option for us. I want to just contribute because, you know, I, I lead I lead a band. We tour the world all year round. You know, I do, I don't know, anywhere between 50 and 60 shows a year with my group. Europe, Africa, South America, Central America, the Caribbean, North America. And if, in terms of the relevance of band music, as a performer, um, I see the effect of it. It reminds me of the relevance of it. If you're not on stage in front of people, seeing how music works medicinally, people forget that music is actual medicine. Like people actually forget that music is medicine. And the more musicians you have on stage together, playing harmoniously in the same groove, interacting tastefully, it is a medicinal thing. It's also a spectacle. It's something that uh, Bob Blakey always said, music washes away the dirt of everyday life. And it's something I remember before I go on stage every day. Because I know that sitting out in the audience is always somebody who came there to forget about something that happened before. And so when I think of bands, like I think of a steel band, right? Now it's that 
Dusty Obama might be the lowest paying gig on the planet, maybe. You rehearse for three and a half weeks, two, sometimes a month and a half, two months. And back in the day, they used to get you $400 at the end. Like, I used to get a check for $400 at the end of the season. So that's literally what, I don't know, if it's per hour, it's like 50 cents an hour or something. It's very low, right? But the therapy of hearing that pan and seeing how people react to the sound of the pan is what brought me back in that pan yard every year to this day. Um, I think one of the things, you know, Peter talked about economics and, you know, you saw bands get bigger when they needed bigger bands. And, then, and that was because they didn't have sound systems. They didn't have microphones to use, so they needed more mute instruments to play bigger halls so you could fit more people in. And then you got sound systems so the bands got smaller again. My advice to a young player would be one, work on your craft. Develop as much skill as possible on whatever your tool is. Whether it's a trumpet, guitar, and PC, whichever instrument. Someone who knows will find somewhere for you to be, to do that well. And it's in that space that you will find your voice. Miles Davis was in Charlie Parker's band. Charlie Parker was in Billy Eckstein's band. Boxy Sharp was in Starlift. I could go down a long list of people who came to be because of someone giving them a chance. And I think that's really what we need to keep in band culture, is a space for people to experiment and develop a sound, develop their craft, because it is a means of modern Creole communication. And as a composer, as a, as a composer who's written for orchestras, big bands, steel bands, choirs, I could go down the list. I need bands because the computer doesn't make it sound good. You know what I'm saying? Like, I need breath. I need nuance. I need someone bending a note. Imperfection. I, I need the imperfection. You know, I need all of that in sound. I need to hear the click of the keys on the metal. You know, like, I, I need to hear the stick the drum and the wind in between that it causes. So for me, that's my encouragement always and the best way to do it, I mean I started a carnival band maybe six years ago and it was out of, I was like there are no live bands on the road in Toronto for carnival and as soon as I announced it, we sold out because there were hundreds, maybe thousands of people who had been missing the same thing I had been missing. But that's not always the case. But in this one, it was. And it was a beautiful union. So I would say, and I, at the end of it, that was because I was good at my craft. And I, I put it out there. Somebody found a space for it, and the rest is history. So I think once you have faith, things will take care of themselves. One of the things that I do at home, granted, Barbados' music industry in comparison to Jamaica's is like, almost, I mean, it's hard to even think of how you would compare it to. But, um, one of the things that I do, I work with musicians. There, I have a band that works maybe five or six times a year. And we have roughly three generations of musicians in the band. So, there are two musicians in that band that are like five years younger than my children. And then there are five musicians in the band whose parents are younger than I am, right? And one of the things that we do in every performance is that we take Barbarian music from set 60s and 70s and we rework it in a way where I encourage everybody to put their two cents in but it's instrumental even if it's a song that originally had vocals and because these young people are in these bands all of their friends come to the shows and all you know, so there's a, a different kind of people that would come. If you hear it as a Nicholas Banker concert, 
a lot of older people are gonna come. Um, you know what I mean? I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but that's what happens. But with these other people in the band, a whole other set of people come. And invariably, at the end of the show, I would hear them saying to the people in their band that they knew, I did not know that I would like a song that they have a singer. I did not know. And they would find themselves at the front of the stage dancing and not understanding why they are even there. You know, because there is this innate response that we take for granted but that is inevitable. And I don't know that I go anywhere else in the Caribbean and see a band with that many different generations in it playing music from that many different generations interpreted in so many different ways. Yeah. So the conversation is multilateral. It is not just generational. It is, it is about where the music came from and how you approach the music. So if you, Take a song from 1960 and you say, so suppose that song was written today, what would it sound like? And you give the younger people in the band the chance to say, well, this is what I think it would sound like. And we would make an arrangement based on their perception of this thing. And it doesn't always work, but the conversation to me is important because then they become invested in something that they were never invested in before, which is how do I make this song sound like I made it? How do I make this personal to me? And by extension, all of the people who are my contemporaries who have a similar type of um, cultural and social experience. So from that, there are more younger people that want to play now. I want to come to learn and you know, are starting to pick up instruments and approaching things differently and listening to music that they ordinarily would not listen to. Um, and I mean, it's a very small microcosm, but in my mind, powers that are greater than me and brains that are bigger than me, such as Law and all of the rest of you, can see that as a kind of concept that we can expand and use for, in an educational and academic context, and also in um, industrial music context. Um, I am trying to do it more and I want to, I mean I've been asked to go to Trinidad and do it in a way and I'm going to try to do that. Um, but it is important for me to feel like, I don't want it to feel like we saying that band music must come back, meaning that it is that we have to play what we used to play. It is that we have to make it relevant to now, but we have to make it also on the same level as as it used to be, so that it, it has a, an, an aura of continuity and that people feel invested in making it current, but great at the same time. Yes, and you're right, there, are, there aren't many bands that have that kind of um, spread of generations. So. And um, I did notice that when I, I watch your videos online, I was like, wow, that's cool. So, so um, you, you kind of answered one of my questions because one of the things I wanted to ask was, um, who, who really listens to band music? You know, what age people, what generation? Millennials, is it Gen X, Gen Z, whatever. But, um, you know. Everybody listens yeah, to band. That's right, the Everybody <laughs> listens to everything once it is presented in a way that is attractive to them. Exactly, all right. There is no restriction. Yeah. But you can't say, it's like medicine. You can't say, okay, this can taste bad, but you have to do it. <laughs> you can't say that, right? Yeah. It has to be chocolate, or it has to be curry goat a different kind. It has to be peas and rice another time. It has to be a little beer another time. It has to have appeal but standards and people have to feel invested in being part of what carries it forward <clears throat> you know and, and that goes for the audience as well right? yeah but the audience is part of it yeah. you know i mean the other thing is that 
I don't know, I mean, a lot of people go to Cuba. We were talking about Cuba a lot. Yeah. One of the things, the most striking things about Cuba is that everybody in Cuba can play, right? Everybody in Cuba can play something, and not just average, they can play well. Which means every musician that is on stage has to be better than who is in the audience. If not, why are you up there? Because we can all play, yeah. right? Um, if you look at how um, all pervasive Jamaican sprinters are, um, I watch in Barbados, I can see the Jamaica High School National Championship on TV. I can see that in Barbados, right? And it is full because everybody in Jamaica knows what running is. So the people that are actually excelling have to be that much better than everybody else. And I feel that is how it used to be with cricket. I was telling the others today, our English test team came to Barbados in the 60s and was beaten twice by a club team because Barbados' cricketers at the time were so great. There were West Indies cricket, Barbadian cricketers who could not get any West Indies team that would get into any other West, any other cricket team without even thinking about it. Because everybody was good at it. Everybody could play cricket. And I think we, we, we take our musical talent for granted. So we won't develop it because everybody can sing. I mean, you know, Anywhere in the Caribbean, you tell, you wait for people to sing, and when they start singing, you but you should you should be singing, you should. Be. So, but we have to make everybody recognize how important it is to be good at what you do, so that the people that are actually practitioners in it become great. But the only way to rise above it is to be great. You know, um, all of that is work that I cannot do. I don't even know if you could do it. This is part of it, but. Nation, the Caribbean nation needs to do that for us all. We can't do it for our, in our little silos. Here, here. Yeah. Sure, please. Yeah, just to add, first of all, I totally agree. Is this on? Yeah. You can hear me? Okay, good. Um, I think the run in brings up this part of the ecosystem, how there's an ecosystem of athletics in Jamaica. and all the different parts are playing their own parts and they come together and they create a greater whole than the individual parts would have done. And the music ecosystem in Jamaica maybe is not as healthy as the athletics ecosystem and maybe we need to start thinking about the ways we can make this ecosystem more healthy because there's something called emergence, right? Where parts that don't have a quality when they come together create this new quality. It's how life apparently seems so start to come to it. Um, and if you think of a band like, well, maybe not the right place for it, but the Sex Pistols, where none of them could play anything. They're all terrible musicians. But if you listen to their music, it's actually listenable because they come together and something happens. There's other bands where like, the musicians couldn't particularly play very well. But there's something special about coming together creatively that creates possibility and then you know, leaves the space for amazing things to happen. But it's really based on the ecosystem. It's really based on there being the conditions for this to arise, I would say. So, how do we create this ecosystem? <laughs> what is needed? I mean, it comes down to economics. <laughs> I always say that it comes down to economics. This is not cheap. No. Instruments are not cheap teachers are not cheap and the places where you see great ecosystems for music is you see maybe 10 20 years back maybe 30 maybe 40 someone put something in place like i look at the french national football team now for 40 years ago france didn't have any football side 30 years ago france didn't have any football side and whoever decided they wanted to get back to the way they were when Platini was playing. So they got some land, and they built an academy, 
and they hired the best trainers and boys from age 12 to 14 go there to develop ball skills, speed, only. And then from there, they went up. And out of that first class, you ended up with the team that won the World Cup in 1998. Right? It, it takes time. And I think in the Caribbean, we have this like fast food culture where you put it in some sizzling oil and it's ready in five to 10, 15 minutes, depending on if it's frozen or not. Right? And then you put it on the plate, they give you a little bit of money, they eat it and they're gone. It doesn't work like that with music. And it definitely doesn't work like that with music education. Right? It takes sometimes a generation, but at the core, it takes patience and it takes investment which is the key. It takes support, lots of support. You need to see people coming out to shows. You need to see people, um, you know, I, you know I'm a, I teach at University of Miami and so much of what I do, besides the teaching and the playing, is about interacting with the people who support the school. Because a school is nothing without support. Even though a school is just a combination of a gathering of teachers and students in a space, to gain knowledge at the end of the day, a school wouldn't exist without the bricks, you know, without the water running, without the lights. So I could go down a long list of simple things that we take for granted when we hear. But when you hear a trumpet playing, you're not thinking about the hours of work and the hours of that teacher work, the traffic that that teacher sat in to come and teach that student. There are all these different things that come into play. But at the end of the day, it takes investment. And I hate to say it, that's why we are where we are in the Caribbean. And we've seen different things grow. We've seen different things grow, and unfortunately, people don't want to invest in the creative industries. And at the end of the day, what do you know a country for? You know Jamaica for Becky. You know Trinidad for Calypso, Soka, Steve. You know, Cuba for salsa or mambo. All of these countries, our identity comes from our art. The only way that that identity can survive is by being taught. And the only way it can be taught properly is with the proper support. Thank you, Etienne. I wish, I wish so many other people were here to hear this. <laughs> Music education is for everybody. In the same way that everybody has to learn mathematics and English yep. and all of that. Everybody has to know about music. And the point of music education in high schools, primary schools, secondary schools, yes, those people who are musical may become musicians, but in my mind, that's not the point of music education. It is to, ve to develop an appreciation so I, th I believe that's where that appreciation starts. Um, I, I know certainly for Jamaica, you know, that aspect of our music education in secondary schools is, is not where it should be. Let's leave it there. But um, it's, th I believe that's where it starts. That's where it starts. Secondary schools throughout the Caribbean most of the music educators in secondary school are not performers, they're theorists. Mm -hmm. So they That's cannot help teachers, yeah. cannot help yeah. students yeah. to understand what it is like being a performer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. That's, I'll agree with that wholeheartedly. You, um, the, the few <laughs> schools that have a music class, they go into class and there's this teacher trying to ram basic music theory down their throats rather than making them learn to love music, yeah. learn to listen to music. Yeah. That, that's, that's, that's one of the lamentable things about the music system. So a lot of work to be done. The young person that has been affected by social media, you know, with the attention span of 90 seconds. <laughs> you know, how, how do we reconcile that with our aims here? Well, you know, they say that, right? But they spend hours on the 
phone. I don't know how you could call that a short attention span. <laughs> it may be that they watch along with different things, but if they are into something, they will watch it yeah. over and over and over again. It's, which brings me back to the other point, which is about how do you make it interesting? How do you make it engaging and make them feel like they are part of the thing itself? Um, I had the privilege of being taught at school by who I feel is probably one of the greatest music teachers in the Caribbean, a lady by the name of Janice Millington. Yeah. And, um, she didn't teach music in the strictest sense. What she did was she made us listen to it. And she made us understand its social value. And it made us respect it. And so when we started to learn it, we approached it from a completely different perspective. She would not necessarily come in and say, like, we all had recorders and all of that. She would come in and play us something by Shit, Korea, for example. And half the class would be like, who the hell is this, right? But then she would explain, okay, so this guy is from here, and this piece of music sounds like this because of so and so, and this is what was happening when it was written, and this is the result of it. And it made the music mean more. And our interest was piqued. Not in a different way. And um, a lot of the time when I have mentoring sessions or whatever, I don't talk a lot. We play music, we listen to it, we discuss it, make it relevant, make it important, make it personal. You know, that way I think there's a different kind of commitment. It's not a a passive arrangement is a personal arrangement. Um, and I think if, if, if we could do that more in more spaces, people would become much more sensitive, I think. Yes, indeed, a more Caribbean-focused um, education system as opposed to taking other education methods and templates and using them here. I just want to ask a quick question. Gender and band. Yes. In the steel bands, um, it's pretty much a balance. You usually find females you know, in all levels of steel band culture. They arrange, they play, they are band leaders. So um, I don't think that there is a, uh, an expectation or people say that women shouldn't play music or play an instrument but when you compare that to other bands it's um yeah the, the balance is more stark do you have any comments do we do we why do you think do you think it's chauvinism that's, that's no i don't i, I actually I no i don't so. think so. i no 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 that's not what i'm suggesting at all i have my um my my fear is what i'd like to hear what you you have to say I actually don't think it's chauvinism. That's why I brought up the steel band comparison. Mm -hmm. Because women do participate in instrumental music in the steel bands and at high levels. Yes. So it's not a chauvinism thing in my, in my um, perspective. I mean, in orchestras, it's pretty much 50-50, I would say. And in chamber music, um, nowadays, in, in the jazz realm, it's it's very still thin on the very male heavy and um it's it's rapidly changing though um i mean but you know i hate to say this and i might sound i might sound but there have been many many great groups of all women musicians in jazz throughout the history and they just weren't recorded and that was a choice that was made by some record label exec who was probably a man. Yeah. 
And as a result of that, generations have gone by thinking and women didn't play jazz. But you had a band called the International Sweethearts of Rhythm, right? With Dolly Jones on trumpet and um, Clara Bryant, who was one of the most incredible trumpet soloists ever to play the horn. And I could go down a long list of incredible musicians, Melba Liston, who used to live right here in Jamaica and who was a ghostwriter for some very famous arrangers and composers. Um, and I don't know why they weren't featured. Actually, um, Hazel Scott's mother, Alma Scott, Alma Long Scott, who was from Trinidad, had an all-woman big band in New York, and they used to tour all over the US. So I think it's important for us to understand that we are fighting against a construct that has been there. And even though that construct was there, many, many great women broke through that generation after generation. Now you have people like Terry Lynn Carrington with the Jazz and Gender Justice um, program at Berkeley College of Music. And so, you know, Terry, you have Esperanza Spaulding, Jerry, Jerry Allen was a great pianist, um, Renee Marie is someone I work with a lot. And so we're changing it. I think we are making it better for the next generation. Like, so there's a great drummer named Savannah Harris. She's from, she's actually of Jamaican descent. Her grandmother's Jamaican and she lives, she's from Oakland, California. And she plays in my band from time to time. And I took her to Trinidad and um, someone came up to me after and they said that they had never seen anyone play the drums like that. Mm -hmm. And they thanked me because now they were gonna go and pick up playing drums. So it, it doesn't take much, but um, it's changing in the jazz realm. In the band realm, as you said, steel band is 50-50. Basically, probably more women steel band players than, than men now. And it's something that we need to change. And we have to commit to making sure that women have the same access to the instruments and education. Yeah, and it's also smart to really invest in women entering the space more uh, regularly because there's a, um, it's easy to sell, man. Like it's not, it's not, a, <laughs> it's not rocket science that A, in um, our culture, we have a lot of space for women to be like humans, first of all, which is not the case all over the world. Uh, and then second, a lot of women who are doing non-traditional things anyway. So that narrative, if we're talking about taking this worldwide, that narrative is great that we're addressing like millennia old uh, injustices through the music, you know, not just racial injustices and class injustices, but gender injustices as well. So it makes total sense for us to really start focusing on not just, not just like tokenism, but actually like creating space for women to make the music their own thing, like take it in different directions and whatever, you know what I mean? It's just, it just makes total sense. The same way that it makes more sense for us to focus on the reggae girls at this point and the reggae boys. <laughs> same reason. Thank you. I, I mean, as I said, I, I, I don't believe there's any chauvinism there. I personally believe it's just um, access and, and just thinking about me personally growing up. Um, I didn't see any brass instruments, whether played by women or men. They just weren't around. I saw the piano and the guitar. And um, so I, I just think it's exposure and uh, access. And once we solve that, we'll see a little more balance in the, in the arts. Okay, so I think we're going to wrap it up. Um, do we have any closing remarks? Um, do we want to go down the line and talk about um, what you would like to see? Band culture in 10 years time? Or now? Okay, yes, no, we'll I start just, with I just like to see more live music. Just more live music. Um, and if you if you have the, the, the live music, the women will come in too. Don't worry. I, I'm seeing them starting to appear. The bands, you know, they, they, that, that dance band, show band thing is, um, it, it'll take time. 
but it but we will talk. I mean, I, th I think Jamaica has an incredible infrastructure in place already, and it stands on a history that is unmatched worldwide, especially at a school like here. Thank you. And you're welcome. <laughs> it took a lot for me to say that. <laughs> um, but, you know, I look at a place like Antigua, where there are so many great musicians, young, 16, 17, going to school during the day and going to work at night playing music in a hotel. And I think about the fact that they are building 8,000 hotel rooms here in Jamaica right now. Think about that. Think of that number. You have the infrastructure. You have the places for people to play. And you have the musicians to do it. There are thousands of great musicians here in Jamaica. The next step is to get the spaces on board with having live music. There should be live music in every, it should be mandated by the government. There should be live music played by local musicians in every hotel in this country for at least three nights a week. That will immediately create jobs for at least a thousand musicians. It always comes back to economics. And you already have the hotels here. So what I want to see is what I saw when I went to Antigua. Or the last time I went to Barbados, I saw Ricky Braffitt running the music at the hotel. Is young local musicians learning from the elders in a, lo in a local space. If you have enough of that, immediately we wouldn't need to be doing this. Because once music is being played and people are there to enjoy it, the world is already a better place. I can't add to that. <laughs> I can't add to that. Um, I think it would be great if we thought of ourselves as one, if not the greatest per capita contributor to the world of culture, full stop. And that we recognize how important it is to maintain that and to continue. My dream is for jazz at the Lincoln Center, or Carnegie Hall, or Royal Albert Hall in London, to be staging events by Caribbean musicians playing Caribbean music for international audiences on a regular basis. That is my dream. And I know that is only possible if we believe in ourselves and sacrifice enough to make it happen. That is my dream, that is what I work towards every day. And I hope that um, before I die, I get a chance to see that happen. It doesn't have to be me, but I want to be there. <laughs> Come to Jazz and Lincoln Center June 9th and 10th. I'm playing with my band, Carnival the Sound of the People. I feel like everybody is so eloquent, I don't really need to add very much. But I will just say, back there before we, uh, I guess in the green room, these guys were dropping some knowledge on me. Like I, I learned a lot in a very short space of time. And the free flow of information like that, the free flow of energy, the free flow of life is really what makes music live and makes art live and makes everything live and makes us live. And so I really like hope that this isn't like an ending point. Oh, this is a starting point of keeping the connections open, of kind of keeping it flowing, and then let's see what develops. Yes, thank you all so, so, so much. The, the conversation has just started. 
right? There are so many things to, to talk about. So thank you all for coming. Thanks to our sponsors again, Jamaica Tourist Board, the Ministry of Culture and Gender Affairs um, and Sport, um, Spanish Court Hotel, Jamaica Nice, and of course, Digicel Foundation. Thank you. Thank you to Peter Ashburn. Thank you to Etienne. Thank you to Nicholas. Thank you to Omar. And I hope I will see all of you tomorrow. Where? At the jam. At the jam.